When Ryan's when it's time to begin, it's on the rewind to rhyme with John Pollock and waiting the A team that makes sense of these things we see in the ring every week on TV. It's rewind to rhyme for Monday night, download a Tuesday morning from the post wrestling site. It's rewind to rhyme for Monday night on USA now on the John and Wade take the mic. Hello, everybody, welcome to rewind to raw, the live edition of the show. With Wei Ting, starring Wei Ting. Well, co-starring. I defer to you. How are you doing? How was your weekend? Good? Bad? Good, yeah. Yeah, usually the answer is pretty good. Um, I think, I think. Yeah, nothing, you know, it has to be something really bad that happened and nothing bad happened. So it was a good weekend. How about yours? It was, it was well. It was good. Yes. I get up to anything besides talking about castle attack with me uh that that was a significant portion was trying to find time to watch those two shows uh this weekend but i was able to maneuver it well it's the yeah. glory of wait waking up at a uh, six in the morning you, you can get uh something done early rather than later so that was good yeah, that post show is up there right now, everybody, at the Post Wrestling Cafe. We have a lot to get to, so uh, maybe let's put a bit more focus on that Post Wrestling Cafe Patreon on the first of the month, John. That is true, yes. So it's March 1st, so I think first, let's go over what is coming up this month for members of the Post Wrestling Cafe. If you're looking to join the cafe, now is the best time to join. We purposely don't push for the end of the month because... We want you to get the most enjoyment out of it. So if you sign up today, you get the whole month, and that gives you access to the archives. It also will give you Tuesday's edition of Rewind Away, where Mr. Ting and I are going back to April of 1990 to review WrestleMania 6. And we're going to be joined by a special guest. Care to announce it right now? Yes. Dan the Mouthful Bransky will be on with us on Tuesday. We're going to chat about WrestleMania 6, a show that neither of us attended, but... Mr. Lavransky did, so we will be chatting with him about that event. And a show that neither of us have ever reviewed, to my surprise. I mean, it is uh, essentially our white whale, the one WrestleMania we've never done. I'm sure there's like another as well, but one of the few. And considering this one taking place in Toronto, I'm I'm quite surprised we had haven't done it in 10 plus years of doing these podcasts. Until you sit down and you're about 30 minutes in and then you say, yeah, <laughs> this is why. I get uh, why that- we haven't done it, yeah. That is coming up on Tuesday. But Way, what are some highlights this month in the cafe? Well, of course, this weekend, it is the season finale of of WandaVision, and therefore the season finale of WandaVision with me, WH Park. A special announcement coming to you right now. We are going to be doing that final episode live Saturday night, 10 p.m. Me, WH, and special guest, Nate Milton talking all about WandaVision's season finale and hopefully getting some feedback live from all of you listeners. Uh, We've had some tremendous feedback to all the shows so far. So if you sign up right now, you have access to the entire archive uh, before catch up, catch up with the series, catch up with our podcast right before the finale coming out this Friday. Uh, In addition to that, we've got Ask Away coming out next Tuesday. We've got the continuation of our Rocky reviews, but we're actually transitioning to our Creed reviews starting on Tuesday, uh, March the 23rd of this month. So we're going to get that. In addition to that, another edition of Rewind Away coming out later on in the month talking about Evolve number one. That is John Cena's pick. Uh, Evolve recently putting up their archives up at the WWE Network, and we're going to go all the way back to episode one of Evolve, starring Davey Richards versus Kota Ibushi, all the way from 2010. And of course, in addition to all of that, we are going to have the start of our Falcon and Winter Soldier reviews coming out on the 20th of uh, March. So a very busy month there. And the continuation of Rewind to SmackDown every single Friday. That is not only our SmackDown review, but our open call show for all of you guys to be able to interact with us. And I'm very pleased to announce we have a special co-host sitting with me this coming Friday, Kate from Montreal. A lot of you guys will recognize that name in our feedback section. Uh, She's been very active, and we've enjoyed a lot of her uh, thoughts and comments and opinions. So I look forward to talking to her and uh, getting a few thoughts from all of you ahead of 
uh, everything. So sign up for that. That's all for uh, basically what you get at the base tier. But if you choose to subscribe to the higher tier, you can get live editions of this Rewind to Raw, Rewind to Dynamite every Monday, every Wednesday, and this coming Sunday, a live edition of our AEW Revolution post show Sunday night. Yes, so all double double ice cap and espresso patrons, you get live rewind to raws, dynamites, and the pay per views, uh, which we've got AEW this month, fast lane. Also, because of the way the month works out, there are going to be three rewind aways this month. We'll be doing ones uh, this week, then the week of March 16th, and then March 30th. So three rewind aways that you will be uh, getting from us. And on top of that, oh, we have- before you do that. Before you make your, you're about to make your big announcement, aren't you, John? Uh, I was going towards it, but what else do we have to mention? So uh, in addition to that, another bonus that we're going to give to all patrons this month is a series of rolling deals I have for uh, items at store.postwrestling.com. And this week, in celebration of the season finale of WandaVision, we are giving all of our Post Wrestling Cafe patrons 15% off our Marvel t-shirt. That is a t-shirt featuring uh, an epic Civil War battle between myself and John Pollock pictured at store.postwrestling.com. So 15% off. Get the coupon code. If you are a Post Wrestling Cafe patron, you should be seeing that in your mailbox right now. If you sign up, it's it'll be right in that front page at postwrestlingcafe.com. So it's a loaded month of March uh, for those in the Post Wrestling Cafe, and we're now going to announce that at the beginning of April, Saturday, April the 3rd, we are going to be presenting the first ever post-podcast day. We are going to be doing a live stream featuring many of the shows that you listen to on this network. We're going to be doing uh, six shows in total. And this will be available to all members of the Post Wrestling Cafe. You will be able to log in and watch and listen to all of these shows live beginning at noon Eastern that day. And we're going to be running uh, all throughout the day into the evening. Uh, Over the next few weeks, we'll be announcing the shows and people from this network that will be participating. We're working out some cool ideas for uh, themed shows. Uh, We can announce one of them will be a live edition of Ask Away for the month of April with myself and Way uh, taking live calls. And we're going to be doing that at the conclusion of post-podcast day so we can go as long as we need to. But we have some cool announcements to make over the next month. But that is post-podcast day on Saturday, April the 3rd, noon Eastern. All members of the Post Wrestling Cafe will have live access. That's our WrestleMania. Coming right up. It is. It's the week before WrestleMania, so we wanted to do this uh, where it doesn't uh, conflict with WrestleMania weekend where there's going to be so many shows going on and would be way too busy to do it. So instead, this will be the weekend prior and we can look ahead to everything that's coming up, uh, but it should be fun. We have six uh, distinct shows that we are planning and hopefully this goes well. People enjoy it. I think it'll be a fun interactive experience and you can pick and choose which shows you want to check out and then they will be available after the fact as well very exciting i know that's a lot to throw at all you guys but uh we will be hammering at home every single episode i'm sure in the weeks to come so uh stay tuned well with that let's talk about some brackets way the new japan cup they have released a bunch of announcements from new japan uh the new japan cup this year Not going to be a 32-man tournament. Instead, it's going to be a 30-man tournament. And it will start this Thursday with the anniversary card. So the way they're structuring this with the odd number of 30 instead of 32 is that on one side of the bracket, Evil is going to get a bye to the second round. On the other side, Hiroshi Tanahashi will receive a bye. So we have opening round matches of Satoshi Kojima versus Jeff Cobb, Tetsuya Naito versus The Great Okan, Bad Luck Fale versus Toriyano, Taichi versus Hiroki Goto. Uh, a big one in the first round is Kazuchiko Kata versus Shingo Takagi, Tomoki Honma versus Minoru Suzuki, and Kenta versus Juice Robinson. On the other side of the bracket, Will Ospreay versus Hiroshi Tenzon, Zack Sabre Jr. versus Gabriel Kidd. That should be a very entertaining match. Yuji Nagata versus Yota Suji, Tomohiro Ishii versus Sonata, Chase Owens versus David Finley, Yoshihashi versus. Yujiro and Toa Hanare versus Jay White. And the way that this is structured over the 13 events, I believe it is, 
the most that they're going to be doing, it, it's two events that have three matches, but most of the shows, it's limited to two tournament matches per show, meaning that if you just want to follow the tournament matches, it's fairly easy to just set aside 30 minutes, 40 minutes per day to catch these matches. And that's probably max you're looking at. Like they, this is a reasonable amount for people to just follow the tournament matches over the next couple of weeks. Sure. Yeah. Um, it's, you know, I, I think tur- tournament formats are always um, fun to kind of build some structure and hopefully build some new stars out of this field. Nobody really surprising, I would say coming out uh, of these brackets. Uh, we don't have any integration of the junior heavyweights like we did the last time. And, you know, you're at a point now in the company where I guess you have enough people that you don't really need to. But uh, I'm certainly curious to see, like, what elevation you might have, what what big story, what big breakthrough tournament somebody might have who might be lower on the card right now. Do you have the bracket in front of you? I do, yes. What? Uh, obviously, there'll be some upsets in the first round. Are there any that jump out at you as potential upsets in the first round? Oh, man. Uh, you know, I haven't really completely dove into it, but I I certain- can see a few. I, I could see, I could actually see I- Kojima beating Cobb again. Kojima being in Cobb. Yeah, sure. Yeah. I definitely think Juice is somebody who hasn't had a whole... Uh, by the way, he's returning. And, and he's yeah. somebody who hasn't... I, I, I think Juice is being focused. Kenta as well. That When I looked at the brackets today, I, th- I think Juice beats Kenta. I'm with you. Mm-hmm. Um, um, you know, Jay White, I see pr- going pretty far, which is somewhat unfortunate because I think Toho Hanari is another guy who really should, um, mm-hmm. you know, could have a breakthrough um, year, I would say. Uh, and but he, he his first match is Jay White, so you know if they're serious about really maybe pushing him, like that would be a way. But I can't see him beating Jay White. I think Zack Saber Jr. and Gabriel Kidd's going to be awesome together, and I think it's a lock that we're going to get Zach and Osprey in the second round. Oh, interesting. Okay, yeah. Well, I would say you your don't favorites. Know, I, by the way, Tenzan was not punished seemingly for using those illegal. No, so the Mongolian chops. chops are back. Just uh, forget that stipulation. Yeah, absolutely no no punishment for for Tenzan at all, other than he draws Will Osprey in the first round. So, um, yeah, I, th- I I guess you would have to look at some of the favorites here. Certainly, Okada, Jay White. How, how I, how I see Okada? Osprey. O- well, how about Okada Shingo? That's a tough one. I think Okada has to win that one, but um, that's a big match. I'm surprised they are doing that in the first round. Obviously, it's for a reason, but that is a huge match you're giving away. Um, that's on March 6th. And what about, um, I guess, like the other ones, uh, I, you know, not really. Like, what about uh, Okan, Naito? I- I think Naito will. Ba- I, I think Naito's going to bounce out Okan in the first round. It feels like Okan's kind of had his his turn after the latest uh, loss. That I see Naito advancing in that first round, unless Naito's really banged up and they are going to do the upset there. But that would be that would be a mild surprise if Great Okan beat Naito. Mm-hmm. So who's yeah, winning? Um, who's winning the whole thing? God, man, putting me on the spot. Well, uh, who's going to face Ibushi for the belt? Or Desperado. Belt. Uh, or Desperado. You're, yeah, you're right. Um, oh, fuck. That's a really tough one. I'm going to say... I don't know, dude. I'm wild guess. I'm going to say Will... Man, Will Osprey seems too soon for this spot, don't you think? But I, I'm leaning towards Osprey. Um, I think Okada is too soon. I think Jay White, it's too soon to go back to that. And unless it's Desperado. And... Uh, I would say Osprey. I think I think I could see a scenario where it's like on that top uh top right bracket, it's Ishii Osprey in the final four. I could see that. Or sorry, Ishii in there th- those two meeting to I guess uh set one of them the up for four. the final four. Yeah. 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 I I'm gonna have to really sit down on it with with, with the with the brackets, but I mean Osprey seems like a decent choice, mm-hmm. sure. Should get should be some very good matches. So that starts on Thursday, and the anniversary card lineup. We've got uh, the opener is going to be Minoru Suzuki, Zack Saber Jr., Taichi, and Doki against Hiroki Goto, Honma, Gabriel Kidd, and Master Wato. Tanahashi, Juice, Finley, and Toa Hanare, and Ryusuke Taguchi against Evil Kenta, Jay White, Chase Owens, and Taiji Ishimori. Six man with Okada, Ishii, and Sho against Shingo, Sonata, and Bushi, and then the top three matches. 
We have in the New Japan Cup opening round, Jeff Cobb versus Satoshi Kojima and the great Okan versus Tetsuya Naito. And then the final double championship match, Kota Ibushi defending against El Desperado because after this match, the Intercontinental and IWGP heavyweight titles will be unified to form the IWGP World Heavyweight Championship. Title unification. What do you think of this? It's been, it's been to my surprise, like a mo- more controversial than I thought. I think because they're playing around saying like this is going to start its own lineage and that mm. people are, I mean, if you're going to look at a company that it's very tied to title histories, um, New Japan is one of them that you would put on that list. Um, I, I don't think it really erases the lineage. It's, it's right there. Are we no longer um, going to get the roll call? Um, that would be a big did, mistake if they did that. Or did they, they combine the two that. roll calls? Uh, you'd need two screens and then you do the, the back. <laughs> I mean, the, the screen on the left is going to have to have a lot longer runtime than the one on the right for the intercontinental champions. But, um, yeah, they're doing it. And I mean, it, it I, I'm not uh, too upset about the elimination of a championship. It's just the IC belt has been something they've, they've built up significantly. I don't know if this is the most opportune way to do it. It just feels like we're doing it to do it. And it's almost like we have no big hook for Kota Ibushi and El Desperado that the last double championship match is the hook. And they're just scratching and clawing like, hey, we wrestled in 2014. It's like they, this was not the plan. And they're trying to yeah, like it's even at limited capacity. It's Budokan Hall. And they're trying to make this feel at least add some kind of a historic nature to this match that is I, I, I do it, think it's a the tough sell, to, like just as a as a ticket selling match. But I do think the plan to unify was probably in place even before Desperado c- came into the picture. It's it's uh, that that it was, but I just feel it's being I I wonder if it's being uh, moved up to just be significant here as opposed to doing it at a time where maybe it would make a bit more sense. Perhaps, yeah. I mean, um, I think it, you know it is somewhat I so, somewhat sad to see those. Very iconic belt designs, both of them go away because I think people really love them. Um, but you know, I'm 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 not upset when you eliminate titles. Uh, I think they're doing you know a relatively admirable job thus far of trying to elevate the never. Um, so you know, the U.S. title eventually will probably make its way back over there too. So I think New Japan already has too many belts. I'm not really upset about it, um, but it just kind of makes things. We've had this double championship for a year now. I don't think it's like it's about time uh, that I think they made a move like this. Moving over to AEW, their women's uh, title eliminator tournament is now down to Ryo Mizunami, uh, who beat Yuka Sakazaki on the show that aired Sunday night, uh, which had its issues. For those that were outside of the U.S. trying to log in to watch this, uh, international viewers were kind of shut out. So AEW did put, put the whole thing up on YouTube and you could watch it after. Uh, did you see any of the Sunday show? I did not, no. Okay, I would highly recommend the six-woman tag. Uh, it was Maki Ito, Benny, and Emi Sakura against Hikaru Shida, Mei Saruga, and Rin Katakura. This this blew away the other two matches for me. I thought this was just an excellent match that if... This would have been in a live setting. It would have tore the house down. And to a television audience, it would have been breathtaking, some of the stuff they did. It was 18 minutes plus, and I thought everyone shined in this. Maki Ito is incredible. Um, Venny looked fantastic in this. And it ended with Hikaru Shida just um, having this long sequence with Venny, who just kicked out of everything and finally the uh, used the Tomoshi to pin Venny. Uh, this this six woman was fantastic. I, I thought this match was just great. It sounds awesome. I've seen Brian Cage rave about it, and uh, plenty of other people rave about it. So it's definitely on my list. Would you say it's, it's one? Um, it's, it might be the best match I've seen in this environment where there's no fans and it's just emptiness. Like was they, it your match I, I couldn't imagine week? like this in front of a crowd. Like they would have just lost their minds for this. Was it your match of the week last week? Uh, I wouldn't say match of the week. I had uh, Naito Abushi was very high for me. Jay White and 
Ishii was very high. Those, those were at a different level, but this was this was up there. This was a really solid match. Um, so I would I would recommend that. I thought this uh, out out the tournament matches that were on the show, which were uh, Mizunami defeating Yuka Sakazaki, and then they had uh, Thunder Rosa defeating Riho, which set up tonight's match where Nyla Rose beat Thunder Rosa, which was a uh, a fine match between the two. I saw all of these, but that leads us to Nyla Rose and Ryo Mizunami on Wednesday, and then the winner faces Shida on Sunday. My predictions were way off. I did not predict Ryo Mizunami to make it to the end, and I feel like I didn't predict Thunder Rosa to even make it to Nyla Rose. So, uh, what's your prediction? I mean, I feel like they're. You either go with the big rematch between Shida and Nyla Rose, or you go for something fresh with Mizunami, and you're bringing, you're going to the extent of bringing Mizunami all the way over here that it would seem to make more sense to have her just win the tournament if you're going to that length. Um, Mm -hmm. Or you just. And it's a fresh match. Like, I feel like I've seen Shida and Rose enough. Yeah, I kind of would prefer to see Mizunami. Like, the, the match with Yuka Sakazaki was very good. She's had very good matches throughout the tournament. So I think it'd be something fresh. It's, like, a great, like, stylistically, just the way she's built. It Like, she can play a very good foil to Shida. So I think that that would provide a very solid match for Sunday's pay-per-view as well. So that is the tournament update. And the final note before we get to Raw, uh, Vice has added a new talk show dark side of the ring confidential different from wwe confidential i'm sure uh this will be hosted by conrad thompson with uh, co-producers jason eisner and evan husney as they are going to do uh i think the the order was nine episodes that they had said they're going to be 90 minutes uh talking behind the scenes of past shows that they've done Eight episodes. Okay. And it premieres next Tuesday, March 9th on Vice at 9 Eastern. And I think it's just Vice saying, hey, we don't want to wait till season three. And what more content can we get out of Dark Side of the Ring? Like they are all in on Dark Side, which I mean, if you even watch the trailer for this uh, talk show, I mean, they're plugging Dark Side of the 90s, Dark Side of the football. This is going to be dark side of the network. That's what this is going to be rebranded as at some point. Vice is not going to be as valuable. I mean, dark side of the the vice, I think, is the show that they should probably themselves. Well, they probably could self-produce that one and have no shortage of content. Yeah. Um, uh, you know what? It, it just it sounds like it's it's a podcast, but like, you know, um, they literally did this podcast, the three of them throughout season two. They did the podcast and now they're like, it's. Like taking the other subjects and they're going to have guests on and stuff like that. But yeah, I mean, it's taking the podcast and making a televised version of it. I'm sure the content will be great. Um, you know, I, 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 at this point, it's like I'm, I'm sure Vice is happy to have anything associated with this brand that they can get. And podcasts or TV, made for TV types of podcasts are relatively cheap to produce. And I'm sure will attract a good amount of attention to and, and buzz uh, to set up for the next season. So. I'm I'm curious to see what sort of new bits of information we might get. I mean, Vice, it's like this is a relatively cheap program to produce. It's 90 minutes of talk with footage that you own. I mean, it's and it's a brand that's very strong with your core audience. Really, this should have been the idea for the original uh, companion show they had following the episodes, which we didn't even get in Canada, as I recall. I only saw bits and pieces, but – that seemed to be the biggest complaint from people was this post show that was none of these people were involved in it. Like you didn't have Evan Husney or Jason Eisner part of it. It was just random guests that they would have on or loose links to the subject matter. Um, this to me is a more focused um, show to that audience of who they want to hear from. Curious to see like Kyoto be a part of these now. Yeah. Know, they mentioned several guests will include uh, dreamer, Mike Kyoto, uh, Brian Heffron, the Blue Meanie, Savio Vega. So it looks like they're going to have each show they'll have for 90 minutes. You need to break it up with uh, some some guests and different stuff like that. So anyway, that's starting next week. Eight episodes. No premiere date yet for season three. But I'm sure Vice cannot get this series onto the air fast enough. Like they just seem they are this. Everything is built around the, the dark side franchise for Vice. Mm-hmm. Well, everything on... Raw was built around this championship match, way. 
between The Miz and Bobby Lashley. Now, I'm going to say this off the top. I know people might not enjoy this this Miz title run or the decision to put the belt on him or even maybe the way they went about it. I thought the structuring of this match and just having a show long story was a breath of fresh air on Raw. I I like the way Raw was actually structured and you can make fun of the countdown clock and the bait and switch. I don't really have a big issue on television where you're dangling things and by the end of it you were you were really making yourself want to see Bobby Lashley get his hands on the Miz and they gave you a big payoff at the end and it's very rare that Raw does like a show that's you mix in your main talent into multiple segments throughout the show, you're constantly building it. Like this was a show that was a very heavy emphasis on trying to take this audience that tunes in at the beginning of the show and keep them for three hours, like a very aggressive uh, attempt to do this right down to this countdown clock technology. That seems to be a new staple of raw. I think we're, I mean, I'm really curious to see how the ratings reflect, you know, the growth pattern and and the holdup pattern, because um, I have a feeling it'll do relatively well because I think we're just creatures that are easily manipulated. Put a, clock there we're gonna want to see <laughs> the very end um i agree with you i think you know uh, as a narrative throughout these three hours it's never an easy task to try to man get people to keep your their attention for three hours on one single thing but uh it's rare that they have the promise of a title change to dangle in front of somebody for a tv show and i think they did a relatively good job of, of doing that in the end, it is three hours, though, and I'll say, like... Oh, show, there, there was stuff in this I show I, I did, detested. Yeah, but I'm just saying that the the, the A storyline that they had, like, I like the, the formatting of this show. Like, for all the talk about, you know, how this show is structured and the, the dead points, like, the top storyline tonight, like, I did think, like, the writing team, like, they structured this show to... It, it's... All you can do is attempt different things to try and do this insurmountable task of trying to keep people for three hours. It's a very difficult task. I think the key, though, is that they actually delivered on the promise at the end, because if they did not and they said at the end of this th- these three hours, tune into Fastlane to get the result, I think a lot of people would have had a far more negative reaction to the show. Well, the other observation on this show is that this was the first Raw in a while where it I did watch tonight and it feels like they have at least uh, a top end plan of where they're going for WrestleMania. Fastlane doesn't appear to exist on Raw. Like it almost feels like it's a SmackDown only pay-per-view because there is nothing on this show that is, I came and I don't think Fastlane was mentioned on this show. Yeah. Well, much of the focus was, I I think, you know, probably setting the scene with this happening tonight as well uh, first, but, yeah, as far as other programs, I mean, they do have Riddle and Ali that they might be going to next. But no specific mention of Fastlane yet. We are still several weeks away. Raw doesn't need that show in between. Like, you know what the big match is. Like, what do you need to see Lashley do in between time? Like, really, it's like Drew needs to get the title shot. So maybe that's what the Fastlane Raw side is built around. Drew getting the shot. Mm-hmm. I don't even know if you put Lashley in a match because who is there? Oh, they could put anybody. I mean, Seamus, built- Keith Lee, like... Oh, I mean, Seamus just lost tonight. I mean, they're, in theory, like, who are you going to put just- Drew in to w- become the number one contender with? Possible rematch with The Miz or, like, a handicap with Miz and Morrison. I, 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 there's, there's really no way I think they can convince anybody that Lashley will be losing the belt before WrestleMania. But I, I do think they, they might use it as an opportunity to just, you know, give Lashley a little bit more shine before he defends to make him look that much more dominant. Well, let's go through the show. Drew came out for his big return. He said, it's been a real bitch of a month for Drew McIntyre, which means he's had an awful day. (laughs) Um, Yeah. Yeah. um, Well, that's too bad. It's been a okay month for me. He says he doesn't understand why Seamus stabbed him in the back. I think everyone's questioning that. For uh, an, an hour one match uh, against the non-champion. He says he defended his championship at the Elimination Chamber, but didn't see the next thing coming, where Lashley kicked his ass. And then our resident cockroach cashed in the Money in the Bank contract. That's right. 
the frickin' Miz is the WWE champion, and he proclaims he's going to regain his title and then main event WrestleMania. He didn't go through the Performance Center Raws into the Thunderdome, making the WWE title the number one championship just to get stopped before the finish line, which is getting to Mania as champion. The Miz comes out with Morrison. He asks, why Drew's even upset? I did exactly what I'm supposed to do with the briefcase. It's all Lashley's fault, and he's trying to get Drew to be manipulated into going after Lashley. That will absolve Miz of this championship match tonight, but Drew sees into his plan. Miz says he was threatened, brings up his children, he's a father, and he suggests that they work together as the three M egos. What do you think? Uh, Pretty good. Come on. You would have that would have qualified for a show title. The fact that it, it like loosely plays off of three MB, I will give them a little bit of a point there. Oh, I more wonder so, if that was even so intentional. MVP comes out and just proclaims that Lashley will be champion and the match will begin promptly at 9 p.m. Eastern time. And I will say this uh, during the week crickets. But when the show begins, my God, are they plugging stuff hard of matches to come. And we find out in this opening segment, it's Drew and Sheamus next with about six minutes notice. I, I didn't know that we we're getting this tonight, but um... no one did. Yeah, like I'm, I'm. I can only imagine that they they themselves didn't have this set in stone until earlier today, and even then, like probably didn't feel. And, and it's clear this it. was not just to get to the next. Like this was the blow off match. This was mm-hmm. the if you were going to envision what a, a big pay per view blow off was going to be, this is what they gave you. Yeah. Twenty three minutes of it. Yeah. So, so uh, but I. I, I really enjoyed Miz and Morrison here. I, I, I just enjoyed this opening segment overall. I thought everybody sounded pretty true to character. Uh, you had to, you built up Miz and Lashley, I think, decently well. Miz and Morrison's like extreme gaslighting, trying to get Drew to think that Miz is the victim here and that he should help Miz take Lashley out for him. I, I thought Miz actually did a really great job. I mean, say what you want about him as an in ring performer, as a guy put into this position who is desperate to hold that belt. For you know, knowing that he was going to get demolished in this main event, I I think he played that character really well tonight. For, for his role tonight, he was excellent. And there are mm-hmm. very very few people I think that would have pulled off being pretty much a rodent getting run over by a Mack truck like he did in that main event. Like he he understood what his role is. Bobby is the guy who has to run through me, and there is going to be absolutely zero. That I get. And he just, I mean, completely sacrificed himself in that main event. Um, And he was relied upon heavily in this show. Like, if you, like, this was The Miz needing to carry a lot of segments on this show. And some will love it, some will hate it. But, I mean, there there was a lot on his plate on this show. So, Drew and Sheamus... I would say if I was going to uh, envision this match, this would have been at the higher end of it. I thought that they had like a really high level pay per view quality match, uh, which Phillips, Tom Phillips calls this a pay per view level main event, which evidently the company did not. Uh, Sheamus uh, beats him down for a long time and sends him to the floor with a brogue kick. After the break, Drew is coming back. They're on the floor. And he rams Sheamus into the post, and then he belly-to-belly suplexes Sheamus onto the edge of the announcer's desk. You could not pay me a million dollars to ever take this. This just looked like the worst thing in the world. What an uncomfortable suplex to take. And he's just down. He's got a big scrape on the side of his chest, uh, side of his back. Brutal. I don't know. If, I don't know if any of the moves in this match would have been. Oh, these two just. Yeah, they killed one another. Uh, we had a Glasgow kiss to Sheamus on the buckle. More belly to bellies from Drew. Went through a second commercial. And then they're just trading finishers. There's a white noise for a two count. Future shock for a two count. Drew hits his own white noise off the second turnbuckle for a two count. So <laughs> you know based on that spot, these guys were thinking we got WrestleMania with this match. If they were thinking this level. Uh, Sheamus then sets up for the bro kick and he stops and gets hit with the claymore in mid move and drew pins him in 23 minutes and five seconds. I I thought this was a really strong match. 
especially for Raw. Yes, it was a very good match. Felt pay-per-view caliber in terms of length and conclusiveness. Uh, as hard-hitting as I think you've come to expect from these two. I, I was really impressed by the very well-timed finish. Both of them hitting their kicks at the same time with Drew's making contact first. It looked great in the slow-mo replay. I think overall, now that this feud is over, we could say that I feel like they've exceeded expectations in setting up the story between two guys we really have not seen before on screen together, uh, trying to establish the fact that these are longtime friends. But, you know, like Drew's analogy that he used in the promo, unfortunately somewhat stumbling towards the finish here with, uh, I think, a great deal of decreased interest as they were even promoting Elimination Chamber, getting the match pulled away from them for Elimination Chamber, and then ultimately just doing it for an opening match on Raw. It feels like, you know, especially in a match like this, it didn't have a whole lot of stakes attached to it. No title, nothing, given the amount of time spent. Um, that was the whole reason he turned on the friend. Yeah. So they really, I, I feel bad for the performers because I think they, you know, Seamus especially, I think he put a lot of uh, hard work into turning he baby face and then back to turning into a heel and Drew as well. Uh, but unfortunately, you know, probably didn't pan out the way they wanted to. But the match at the end, I thought was a good TV match. Yeah, I... I almost wondered that did we have to do this now versus there's going to come a time after Mania that Drew or Lashley need an opponent. Um, I think it almost felt like it. we're not thinking that far and we're just going to get this done to move Drew on to the Lashley program and just end this feud instead of keeping Sheamus as like this guy in the in the background that we can always revisit. I do think it's like one too many things, though. Like you've already executed the turn. And I think that in itself had an expiration date before people lost complete interest. So you might as well just kind of cash in while it's still somewhat relevant, you know, on up for a TV match. They can still go back to Sheamus as a challenger. Like he has to run. He can run him over with a car like he did Jeff Hardy. Uh, make fun of it like some some weird, you know, past history. Bring up another kilt that he sets on fire or something. If they want to heat it up again. Naomi versus Nia Jax. They plugged the tag title match coming up on Wednesday. And Lana and Shayna Baszler in the corners. Jax used a bear hug, a Samoan drop, and then lifted her and just choked, uh, choke bomb and destroyed Naomi in 218. It's ex exceptionally rare that I have anything like positive to say about a Nia Jax match. But this powerbomb lift into the choke slam, I thought was really cool. You notice? Like she lifts her like it's a power bomb, but then she'll like grab the 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 yeah. throat, and then like it just like she delivers this like choke slam from a great height. I thought it was a really cool setup for a choke slam. I thought it was really unfortunate that Naomi's role at this point was you know to play setup person for Lana. I mean Naomi, especially after the absence she had, she is way beyond this role. And uh, I guess they're what they're setting up this tag team match. Is that the sense that you got? I can't really tell with Nia and Dude, Shayna by the I way. I can't think of a worse title match that they are promoting than Jackson Baszler against Naomi and Lana. You have Lana who just continually fails. Naomi who was absolutely murdered here in this match. And then you have Shayna. At the very least, I'm watching this thinking, wow, they're really setting up the champions to go into NXT as like the dominant force. And then you have Shayna losing like pretty one-sidedly they to... Charlotte they don't tonight. care like, about NXT at all. Are you kidding me? I don't think that that match is even on Vince's radar. You know, like that just Nia what they demolishing want. the challenger before they've done the title match made no sense. Yeah, I don't know because they've given Lana and Naomi wins in the past, and if they're going to build to that tag match with these two, I just don't know why you would extinguish that that momentum like this. So I. I'm I'm not sure. I mean, Nia and Shayna are being relied upon a whole lot on all the show, shows, all three brands. Um, but in Raw, just in a vacuum, watching this show, I I was definitely confused about what I was supposed to look forward to with them. Tom Phillips teed up the title match. And this is going to be one of the biggest nights in the history of Raw. So Lashley and MVP come out. The Miz's music plays, and they cut to the back, and he's holding his stomach. He says it's stress related. And I guess he's like having a hernia or something. Stress-related hernia. Yeah, I guess. Lashley races to the back. Miz just says he needs more time. Lashley grabs him and says, they'll have a match tonight and I'm going to beat you. 
Pierce says you will defend the title at 10 p.m. Eastern time as Miz is crawling on the floor, grabbing his stomach. And then Samoa Joe says, hey, it happens to the best of us. Has he had hernias? I I imagine this guy was a bag of nerves before that Kobashi match at the Manhattan Center. I'm I'm sure that he was... uh, (laughs) Uh, or where was that? That was at the yeah at the New Yorker Hotel. Anyway, that was the Manhattan Center, wasn't it? Uh, I remember it was like a different venue that they had to go to for that one, as I recall. Um, but there you go. Uh, I'm sure he was very nervous before that it match. The same, showed no the signs same, of it. Yeah, same anticipation. I'm sure. And then they hit the reset, and the countdown clock starts again at an hour, and we're counting down to 10 o'clock p.m. Eastern time. They should really just start the countdown clock, like, as soon as Raw ends. You know, count us down to the next week. SmackDown promo, we've got a steel cage match between Daniel Bryan and Jey Uso. Mm-hmm. Bryan can go to Fastlane. He's getting a second opportunity by Roman Reigns. Yes, yes. Um, After he, Roman wanted Jay to stop him at all costs on Friday. Uh, He's giving him a second chance, so a very kind of Roman Reigns. Maybe he realizes uh, he gets a bonus for every pay-per-view and he needs a better drawing opponent, so he's going to relax his militant stance against Brian getting another shot. Braun Strowman comes out and he says that Shane and Adam Pearce have something against him. He was suspended for headbutting Pearce, which might be what they're holding against him. He was excluded from the Elimination Chamber, so he watched the Elimination Chamber, <laughs> and it sucked. <laughs> Guy it's sucked for him. It well. sucked for him, but uh, maybe he was saying the show overall sucked. <laughs> I didn't think it was such a bad show. Uh, this guy should watch wrestling every week. That should be his gimmick, and he gives us his reviews. He says he's now booked in some tag match tonight, and this is really starting to piss him off. So Shane and Pierce come out. Shane goes on about bettering himself. He's taking these MBA courses in conflict management, which are way above your reading comprehension, Braun. I'm just kidding. I'm just kidding. And the answer to conflict is communication. So Shane has made a match tonight. And in order for you to get along with WWE management, you have to work with them. And he indicates that he's going to be the partner. But no, he says Braun is going to team with Adam Pierce. That sucks. So that's this guy's new catchphrase. Everything sucks. Suck. Yes. He's the WWF's um, portrait of their disgruntled fan base that thinks everything sucks. Shane tells Braun to not have that myopic view and offers him a raw tag title match tonight. That That's all you need. This guy who won the tag titles with a child is now being offered a tag title match just out of the blue. Sure. I hated that. I hate tag title shots being used as just like kind of meaningless garnish, you know, over top of like a a meaningless storyline that anybody can get, even if the team has never tagged before. It makes any team who is subsequently fighting for that tag tag title shot look so stupid. Well, out came Shelton Benjamin and Cedric Alexander answering the question on probably 75% of the viewer's mind. Who are the champions? And we had our tag match. Braun was throwing these guys around, but then he ran into the post in the corner and got double teamed, sent out Cedric, power slammed Benjamin, and had the match won. But Shane is telling him tag Pierce, and Braun's just standing there like an idiot instead of pinning him. So he reluctantly tags Pierce, who goes to the pin and gets cradled by Benjamin in three minutes and 14 seconds. Braun then yells at Shane and promises to wreck this place. A promise that was not delivered tonight. He just went to the back. Oh, he's got a plot like Kevin McAllister. He's got to go put up the, get the schematics for the Thunderdome and prepare his booby traps. I think he's uh, going to analyze the stock and he's going to maybe like wreck it that way. Oh, today was a bad day. The stock was up 6%. So he better Mm. get, get on that. Yeah. Um, so this was all, but I think, you know, pr- the pretty clear confirmation that we're going to get Shane versus Braun in some form or fashion for WrestleMania. And I, I, I am somewhat intrigued by Shane's motivation and all this, because the way he kind of played it, he was definitely antagonistic, um, you know, going as far as to insult 
Braun about his intelligence. And then here at the end, you're clearly fucking with him, you know, to to take the win away. And I don't know why Braun exactly is picking on Braun Strowman. I don't know what motivation that character would have. And more importantly, I don't really know who I'm supposed to cheer for in this story because they both look like assholes. You know, everybody is equally unlikable. <laughs> so um, I'm not sure. I'm really not sure. But that's the match that we're seemingly going to get. Your big stunt match. So, yeah. Sure. And, um, man, like, can you just imagine being in any tag team in this brand? Like, I mean, SmackDown, I think, is a bit better. But if you're on Raw and you're any sort of tag team, you're looking at, like, how your champs are being treated, how these titles are being treated. Like, how can you be excited and motivated? Well, unfortunately, that's uh, that's a very small number because the tag division consists of, what, Lucha House Party? I guess so, at this Retribution. point. Retribution. Uh, Elias and Jackson Riker met with Damian Priest and Bad Bunny. Elias offered Bad Bunny an opportunity because the two of them have had the rare chance to know that their music changes the world and suggests making a single. Damian Priest uh, translates Bad Bunny's response and Damien Priest says, that's a no. Okay. Yeah. Doesn't he speak English? Uh, yeah. I but Damien Priest needed to say something here, so he became the default translator. <laughs> gotcha. <laughs> you want to translate me for me next time? I, I don't have much to say for uh, one of these podcasts. Well, uh... I had plenty to say about this match that we're about to review. Elias and Jackson Riker in the ring. He said his album was snubbed by the Grammys, which is like Tom Brady being snubbed by the ESPY Awards. And then Tom Phillips is like, speaking of Grammys, Bad Bunny got two nominations. So in this rare case, you had the case of like, here's the uh, delusional star. And then we got a real star here who actually has been nominated for some Grammys. Yes, he has. Yeah, which uh, take place in two weeks. Grammy. Well, I would have much rather watched the Grammys, which probably would end in shorter amount of time than this match did. Elias and Damian Priest had a 15 minute and 22 second match where for 90% of this match, it was Damian Priest selling for Elias. Now, I'm not going to completely disparage this match or the participants. I do think Elias has made some improvements, but it is far from a stage where I want to see this guy for 15 minutes. This match went on forever. Damian Priest looked as regular and unimportant a guy as you could possibly uh, put out here for 15 minutes. I thought this match was just like the epitome of boredom, and I was about to die by the end of it. Uh, Instead, I was ready to hit the lights on the match when Damian hit it. And fifteen twenty two, Damian Priest wins, but we all lost. You notice how, like, when Damian Priest does that bow and arrow taunt, he says, he says something now. I believe he says, "Live, live forever, for, live forever." Yeah, I thought he meant this match is going to go forever because I was thinking that's a possibility. I I I also hated this match. I thought it was incredibly long and boring, and for me, completely. I'm not going to say the show was like that exciting to begin with, but it certainly derailed, I think, what um, energy I had for the remainder of the show, starting with this one. It was by far Priest's worst match since he debuted on the main roster. Maybe even he if did you did nothing could... in this match. Like, it was just so, like, well, they had to go bring a guy minutes. up that can do all the spectacular stuff and you neuter him by taking all of it away. And he just gets to do this hit the lights at the end with the bell clap. The bell clap. Like, that's what Tenzon should be doing these days. They had to go 15 minutes. Like, they went through two commercial breaks for this oh, match. My and God. Um, it's it's definitely beyond um, Elias' abilities, maybe even beyond Damian Priest's abilities, too, with this, with this combination. So this was not a good week for Priest. No, no, this was bad. Kayla Braxton was with Randy Orton. <laughs> what do you make of these increasingly bizarre events, Randy? <laughs> Well, what do you make, Randy, of this black goo shit coming out of your throat last week? Not, are you okay? What happened last week? Did you seek medical attention? Is there anything we should be concerned about? No. What do you make of these bizarre events? 
Like, way, if that ever happened to me, I would hope that you would, like, seek medical assistance for me and not just call it, oh, the most bizarre event took place today. John collapsed on a sidewalk while pink shit came out of his mouth and he might be dead. Bizarre event. Hmm. Orton doesn't know what happened last week. We don't even have an explanation for what happened, but he blames Alexa Bliss and tells Alexa... That if she continues this, she's going to end up like the fiend. I'm going to kill you, is his message. And she needs to move on with her life or else there will be no compassion. So Bliss appears on the monitor. She is laughing with a musical box. And she says, bring him back. And she said... Bring bring it back. Bring it back. Okay. Yeah. And there is something Randy should know. And then we cut to a dark hallway where a man in a hoodie is walking towards the camera. And the man in the hoodie reveals to Randy Orton that he is Randy Orton. So we have Randy watching himself on the screen. And evil Randy... (laughs) With the voice distortion. Randy, this doesn't end on your terms. <laughs> so, <laughs> I've officially converted. Uh, I've put my hands up in the air. I refuse to hate this anymore. I'm all in for it, okay? This is the stupidest well, shit. Well, welcome to the club. Okay? Oh, I've reached I've reached <laughs> Wei Ting's level of acceptance. Soon you will come face to face with everything you have ever done. Right now, you are face-to-face with me, yourself. (laughs) So the real Randy (laughs) starts gagging and shit, and he, like, just, like, keels over. He probably, like, flatlined on us as the fake Randy with his distorted voice laughs maniacally as the Black Scorpion, the Black Scorpion of Orton is uh, triumphant over gagging Randy. (laughs) Dude. Tom Phillips and Samoa Joe were like, fuck it. We're moving on to the next segment. Byron, you got to react. I don't know how Randy escapes this haunting nightmare. Well, the Miz and Bobby Lashley are about to go at it a second time. (laughs) Holy Christ, dude. This is the worst feud of the year. It's already won it. Nothing's touching this this year. This is the Okada Omega of shit angles that I don't think anything can top this year. I don't I don't think it's possible. I know I'll sound silly maybe by the time October rolls around, but this this will be a monumentally horrific year if this is not the worst feud of the year. Hey, we haven't seen the match yet. I mean, we still have probably a month and a half to go of this stuff, so I think there's still plenty of depths for it to fall to. We actually did um, see the match. Uh, it was in December, and the match lit the man on fire, which was several angles ago. Well, so you haven't seen the real. There have match. been plenty of matches here, gasoline. Well, all the listen, makings of a big of a big match. I mean, at this point, it's it's just throw all the ideas you have out there. Let's see how how crazy you can get. You know, like what do you have to lose at this point? It's already uh, at this level. You may never revisit something like this again. So. Bring it on, man. Like, um, I don't know what it was. Maybe like a a bunch of fake Randys coming out to the ring. I think Randy should have a match with a, a fake Randy. That'd be great. Um, I, I, I just, I'm, I'm open to it. You know, all signs the, point to this, point to this being, uh, what is it? A Firefly Hunt, Funhouse match. He said, you're going to come face to face with everything you have ever done. That says Firefly Funhouse. Um, Pretty much putting Randy on trial for all. It, you're just going to get a repackage of every heinous act he has ever done. Yeah, we'll see. We'll see how that wait turns for out. six weeks till Mania. Yeah, unfortunately, that's that's sort of the tough part. But I mean, that type of match calls for this type of ridiculous storytelling, and it's man, it's always going to be awkward trying to fit this into the body of a professional wrestling program. Um, I I just I just laugh at it and sit back at this point. So the Miz and Lashley take two. They're introduced. They're saying that Lashley has waited 17 years to be WWE champion. And the Miz says, this is not the stage. We should headline WrestleMania. 
MVP says, F that, we're doing it now. The bell rings, and Miz hightails it. He grabs the belt, sprints to the back, and poor Bobby Lashley had to feign outrage for like 15 seconds here as the count is going, and he's just got to like ball up his fists and clench his jaw and just pace back and forth as he just waits for this count out. 28 seconds, the match is thrown out, and Lashley and MVP are pissed with Shane. They're upset. MVP calls it bullshit. And Shane is going to consider stripping Miz of the title and giving it to Bobby Lashley. Mm-hmm. Charlotte Flair comes out. She says the last few weeks have been an emotional roller coaster. She came back and she wanted to be Asuka's partner and not part of the title picture. But then I got tangled up with Lacey Evans and my dad. Well, my dad has gone home now. And it kind of feels like they have now ended that story. Like that felt like last week's promo was the just hard stop to that story. And I think we're all thankful for it. Um, I think again, there's a great way to use Ric Flair. I don't think it was in a storyline like that. So I look forward to, you know, an opportunity for him to come back that I think is more fitting for him. It's six weeks until mania. Charlotte says, and asks who is going to face Oscar. She's decided I want to face Oscar. But Asuka is home injured after last week, and they replay this slow motion replay of Shayna Baszler blasting Asuka with this kick to the face and this tooth, this giant tooth flying out of Asuka's mouth. Oh my God. This looked brutal. I mean, this was terrible. We we didn't catch it on first viewing uh, last week, but plenty of people were talking about it after. And uh, it looked as bad as I think I I heard that it 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 it, it was. Um, this was really bad. Yeah, really bad. Uh, but I don't. It, it to me, it's like one of these things that probably occurs um, from time to time. <laughs> but this one was pretty bad. Yeah. Charlotte knows that Oscar will come back, and when she does, she's going to challenge her. Baszler and Jax walk out, and Shayna took credit for Oscar losing her tooth. And Nia wishes Charlotte sent herself home because no one in the locker room likes you and says one of us is going to challenge Asuka. Charlotte, you have a nice smile. You may not want to have this match or else Punky Brewster is not going to ask you back for any more appearances. What a Um, threat. Yeah. Yeah. And then Baszler just gets into Charlotte's face and they attack her two on one with Jax hitting the leg drop. And then after the break, we go into the match. The countdown clock has been reset yet again. Miz will defend the title before the show ends. And this, listen, this was probably the smartest way to book Charlotte and Shayna Baszler because these two do not gel well together. And we have seen many instances of that over the past couple of weeks. Flair just fights back with chops, kicks out her leg, knocks Jax off the apron. She blocked a roll-up, stomping down Baszler, and then gets sent to the floor. Jax is sent into the steps And then back into the ring, Charlotte escapes the Kirifuda clutch, kicks the knee, natural selection, 257, Charlotte wins. I mean, I guess just a way Very simple, basic, short. I mean, I don't know why the tag champion is in this scenario, but I mean, less of a priority than Nia Jax is, I guess. You know, Charlotte versus Asuka is a match that I, I feel like I've seen enough times already, and to me, doesn't feel that special for WrestleMania. Um... I, I can't say, you know, their tag title association has really made the feud that much more interesting either. I really do hope Rhea Ripley finds her way into this title picture somehow, uh, because I, I think it's a pretty stale division without her. Was there a promo for Rhea Ripley tonight, the coming yeah. soon? There was one. Yeah. Okay. I didn't see it, but I guess, yeah, I mean, maybe this is, um, she, she has to get involved in, in somehow in this title picture. I think the fact that they're teasing that now. Shane is with Adam Pierce and tells him to go find the Miz. Riddle, Lince, and Grand Metalik against Mace, T Bar, and Slapjack. Uh, the three Strooges screwed up, and Metalik balanced himself off Lince Dorado's shoulders. Uh, this is the most impressive thing in the match, and splashed Slapjack. There's no way you can fall further than being pinned clean by Grand Metalik on Raw. Uh, so, Slapjack. Loses the fall, two minutes and 20 seconds, and Ali is pissed. And he challenges Riddle right on the spot. Yeah. 
Um, I don't know what this move Ali was doing at the end was supposed to be. Did oh, I haven't gotten to the match yet. Oh, I'm um, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> sorry. Uh, so the the impromptu match is Riddle and Ali that had a very good match for the three minutes it lasted. Riddle hit the final flash, but then all of the Retribution members distracted. The ref had his back turned, and the move Way's referencing is Ali has Riddle on the turnbuckle, and he comes off the top, and it looked like it was, I think, to be like a backstabber, but he was like above Riddle's like head and came down. So it looked like whatever he was trying, he didn't hit properly, but I didn't think it diminished it. It was like you could tell he was trying something cool. The the impact was huge, and it, yeah, it looked, like it wasn't it one of those where it looked it looked awful. It just looks like he didn't hit what he was trying to. See, it looked devastating, but like I also like worried that it probably didn't feel very good because I I just I I don't know what he was going for. It's one of those moves that yeah, like somebody makes a big bang, but I don't know who's supposed to be the one that's gotten hurt here like it looked like he was going for a backcracker but then like flips over to the other side yeah it looked like he like yeah kind of you know he he certainly he didn't react any differently he just reacted to the win as if he meant to do it so we'll see if it makes a return next time and then ali tells retribution to follow my lead and maybe you'll be something someday so hell of a team he's recruited here yeah, so no, uh, that Kofi thing is just non-existent uh, and, and probably wasn't meant, like, were they meant meaning to do something with it? I don't know. We but had seems- uh, no, no New Day on the show. AJ and almost weren't on the show. Like, there were several people absent on tonight's show. Uh, Jeff Hardy wasn't programmed, but he was out there for, as a lumberjack, so he did yes. have a role. Miz is with Shane and Adam Pierce and saying, I defended the title earlier, and... Shane is thinking up a stipulation, which he has not thought of yet, with 15 minutes to go. Miz cuts a promo demanding respect. I'm a main event caliber champion. What kind of champion would Lashley be? And Shane says, we'll find out. So last 10 minutes of the show, they have realized that Bobby Lashley, we're going to put him in very short matches right at the end of the show, like they did with Braun last week. And Shane comes out and makes this a lumberjack match. What a visual. Retribution coming at the to the aid of uh, Shane McMahon as lumberjacks for the company. <laughs> Miz tries to use the belt right away, but he's stopped, so he can't get disqualified. Miz tries to bribe some of the lumberjacks, and Drew Gulak sends him back in. Lashley hits a flatliner, punches, military presses Miz to the floor. He's sent back in. Then he signals for the hurt lock, applies the hurt lock. And just like that, The Miz taps out in three minutes and two seconds, an utter destruction of The Miz. Lashley poses with the title. He points to the mania sign. Miz is laying dead in the ring this whole time. This guy could not put Lashley over any stronger until Lashley decides, I'm going to put the hurt lock on again. Just destroys this guy and then stands on top of The Miz's prone body to end the show. Listen, I yeah. hope Bobby Lashley thanks Miz for the rest of time because the Miz was just a he was just a warm body to just be thrown around by Bobby Lashley and I would say there would be a lot of guys in that spot that would not have the ego to allow themselves to be so destroyed in such one-sided fashion. I mean, ego, like this guy was not set to be in any sort of title picture for like, you know, the past 10 years and got a money in the bank run out of it and got a brief title win out of it. And, you know, we'll probably, this like does kind of somewhat elevate him from, I I would say just plain mid card status to at least maybe low upper uh, main event status. So I, I'm sure he's more than grateful for this run. And, you know, anybody who sees this I, result... I'm not saying it was the wrong call, but you you list off past WWE champions that would be as willing to go ahead with this. It'd be very few. It'd be very I think few. we're past that era, honestly. Like, And we we should be of guys like who put up such of a... guys about... that are that don't want to do jobs, that have problems yeah. with how matches are laid out? We I don't should. think we are past that era at all. Well, who, who on that roster do you think would have that attitude? Uh... I think there would be many that would be that would put up a fuss over something like this. If you are a, of a certain level, yeah, I just don't know. I feel I, I feel like the company has so much more power over its 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 wrestlers now. It's not like you know, like you you can have somebody just up and leave to go to the competition with like the well, way. Listen, the end result was like work. you have a super strong champion that you've built up for a year, 
And more importantly, you you have a big match to build to with, with Drew. And I think that yeah. is a big positive coming out of this. It's the big I mean, match that I think feels like a big match. To me, the, like this just seemed like the obvious result. And I, I really don't understand why people were so upset when, you know, they, they the Miz um, cashed in and they actually had him win. It, it just seemed like a transitional uh, way to get the belt onto Lashley for Drew to chase. And that seems to be the story they're executing. Lashley, they've done a tremendous job for to lead up to this moment. He feels like a very hot cha- champion right now. And I would say the events of this these three hours were well done to make this win feel like a big deal that he had to you know his struggle lashley was not necessarily in the body of the match his struggle was to simply get the match and i thought that in itself was like a pretty well told challenging obstacle for him to overcome i th- I think they did such a job with it that you, by the end of it like you wanted to see lashley get his hands on this guy that i was thinking like they they'll they'll push this off and and keep going with this like this idea of miz just how is he going to escape with this title uh, and prolong it. But they gave you the payoff tonight. I I don't think it was a bad call at all. You had to get it on Lashley at some point. They opted to do it now. So I I think you just, you have to set up Drew now to become the challenger, which I think is somewhat, it's really just placeholders because I think everyone knows what the match is. And now we have to go through this period till we can officially make the match. But you do have this fast lane ca- card that for the raw side, they kind of have to put together several matches on their end because nothing has been built yet. Mm-hmm. But overall, I thought, li- listen, there was there was some bad stuff on this show. That Damian Priest-Elias match was terrible. The Randy Orton stuff is terrible. Uh, but I I thought the Lashley-Miz stuff, like, I, I thought, like, they they really worked hard to really structure this match with, like, a show-long storyline with a ton of segments involving these two and a big title change at the end. So I, w- I would say that I think people will come out of that closing moment with a more positive viewpoint on raw than most weeks. It's a raw that I think I would have really enjoyed if it was two hours. Um, they did a great job given the handicap, but in the end it was still a three hour raw with a, a lot of filler, I would say towards the end. So uh, enjoy it in a uh, truncated form. Is there going to be the next generation that are going to watch something like this similar? And it's the four hour edition of raw. And they'll be saying, I would have liked this raw if it had only been three hours. What? But we never complained about Raws being too long when it, there were two hours. I'm sure there were the odd ones, but no. I guess when I, they I, jumped from one hour to two hours, like, did people complain at that point? I, I mean, at the time, remember, it was... Um, the, the shows just got was, a lot better, too, though. Well, it was also, it was a response to Nitro moving to two. So you kind of had the dual thing of, like, it's not just an increase from one to two hours. It's the increase of three hours on Monday night to four hours on Monday night to eventually five hours on Monday night, plus your Thursday programming that they would introduce. So, I mean, it got to be a point in the late 90s where, yes, it's it was this high point for a lot of companies. But, my God, they were, like, think of that, three pay-per-views a month. You have your your ECW each week. WCW's putting out, I mean, just Nitro and Thunder alone is five, throwing out Saturday night. Um, it was it was a lot back then, but it was also a variety of stuff, too, that I think helped. Hmm. Well, let's go to the forum. Do you think the show, get? I think the show will get a pass. Do you think the show, will Raw hit a six? I'm going to say just beneath the six. A 5.29, Wei Ting with his finger on the pulse of the audience. Let's start with Will from Toronto. They teased Miz being a coward so much, I didn't think he would. we would actually get the match. I've never been a Lashley fan, and I found him boring up until the Hurt Business gimmick. However, he's put his body on the line for my entertainment, so I'm happy for him. I just think this should have been done at the next pay-per-view. We'll see what they have planned for the next pay-per-view, but, I mean, is a Miz versus Lashley match... Exciting enough of a draw for a pay-per-view? I almost um, feel no. you could get away just doing whatever match you've got planned for Drew to set him up as a contender, which <laughs> I think it's really hard to make any believable. Like, who do you put against Drew? Like, at the very least, you could have done Drew and Sheamus with the winner getting the shot. Um, you can't even do that now. I almost feel like you should just make the match now. Like, I don't even know how much presence you need of Raw on Fastlane. Yeah, I, part of me wonders if they'll actually do Drew versus Lashley at fast lane with a rematch to come at uh WrestleMania. You know, it definitely takes the luster off of that meeting, especially since they've already met before in the past, but um 
what else do you do in between? Because there's really not much story to tell. It's like you've positioned those two so far ahead of everybody else. It's really hard to do a placeholder match in between. But um, mm-hmm. I, I would definitely hold that one off till till Mania. But I, I don't know what you do in the interim. Let's go to Aaron from Brampton who says, man, how weird was it to see Retribution as part of the Lumberjacks? A few months ago, this would be the type of match they'd interfere in. But now they're no different from the rest of the mid-low card wrestlers. I actually liked how the Miz's show long angle was done. They gave us a reason to tune into the whole show and we were given a definitive ending. I was actually expecting Drew to screw over Lashley and let the Miz pin him. Do you guys think the Miz gets a rematch at Fastlane or will he likely jump into a program with Bad Bunny right away? That was the thinking I had was whenever they do this title change is somehow Bad Bunny gets involved that they they should do some kind of angle that really sets that up and... I guess you could do a rematch, but you have to do it in such a way that there is some compelling reason to do it. Like, this was so one-sided that you almost have to come up with some silly gimmick for Bobby Lashley to, like, beat this guy with, like, an arm tied tie behind his back. Um, mm-hmm. So, I don't know. Ultimately, I think he ends up with Bad Bunny, but you have to get there somehow. So, I mean, you could do it. I just think that there's there's not going to be a whole lot of interest. Granted, that match should probably be five minutes anyway. So it's not going to take up a big chunk of that pay-per-view. Paul from New Jersey. The opening promos total story, but we're a bit meandering. Despite what I really enjoyed, despite that, I really enjoyed the McIntyre Sheamus match, especially the finish. In fact, we were given two definitive finishes in the first two matches. That said, I didn't like how WWE did Adam Pierce tonight. All of the false starts and misdirection led to a new champion. A long, a show long story with a big payoff at the end. Lots of clean finishes on the show as well. I'll take this over most Monday nights. 7.5 out of 10. Matt in Abbotsford says, well, that sucked. Why even have a money in the bank briefcase cash in if you're going to haunt potato the title eight days later? They could have had a month of the Miz weaseling his way out of matches or winning by disqualification and let the angle develop and mature. But instead, we go right into Bobby Lashley, who is a charisma vacuum. I assume Drew will fight Sheamus at Fastlane for a chance at the title at WrestleMania, but where does that leave Lashley until then? Lashley is a lame duck champion who will ultimately lose to Drew at WrestleMania. It's like Raw isn't even trying anymore. I I really disagree with that. Honestly, listen, listen, the Miz money in the bank thing was, it was awful. I think this was the best outcome you were going to get out of that briefcase to do something quick for eight days. Um, Drew and Sheamus, I, I can't imagine how you come back with that match after tonight. Tonight was like the ultimate blow-off match for that. I don't know. That was not a match structured to generate a rematch out of. Um, I mean, lastly, they built, they've they have protected this guy very much for the last year. That this is the strongest challenger you have, or champion, I should say, going into Mania uh, for Drew. More importantly, I mean, I think this whole thing is just to set up a big moment for Drew McIntyre at the end of WrestleMania, and Bobby Lashley happens to be the best candidate that you have right now. Um, Goldberg was an option, but that match I don't think would have been good enough for WrestleMania. I, I, you know, Drew versus Lashley at least promises to be, you know, like a solid 10, 15 minute affair that um, you might be able to, you know, main event a show like that with. So. I think that's ultimately like what they're all of this is set up for. The reason why we had the Miz get the title, the reason why Lashley won it, and the reason why um, he's holding it until WrestleMania. So I I just understand. We got a Kate who says, "Well, tonight was something. The Drew Sheamus match was excellent, although it belonged on a pay per view, and had me believing for a moment that the bulk of the show could be of quality. And then it felt like we all went flying off a cliff." It was obvious from the beginning that we weren't getting the Miz versus Lashley any time before the main event. While I, while I understand that it's difficult to build what was going to be a five-minute match at the end of a three-hour show, I don't understand why they couldn't just have had the Miz dodging the fight and then finally getting called out at the very last minute. It couldn't have been worse than sitting through two entrances three times each. And to top things off, Miz's final plea to Shane actually had some good points. He has been one of the most reliable workers, and maybe that should have warranted a defense at Mania. In storyline, no one wanted to see the Miz main inventing WrestleMania. While I was happy to see Mustafa Ali get the win, and potentially a, potentially a U.S. title shot, I don't believe for a second that he's getting any kind of meaningful push. I usually feel like Raw could have been better, but this week I feel strongly that with the giant opening match and the anticipation around seeing Lashley get the title, it really should have been better. I don't know what that new creative director is doing, but it looks like she's running to the same booking wall as everyone else. 
let's go to Nick. On the whole, I thought this worked as a one-night coronation of Lashley. Doing heel versus heel was always going to be tough, so playing up The Miz as the champion, who's exhausted every option to keep his title for one more week, made sense. Bobby reaps the rewards after a night of build-up and looks like a dominant threat heading into Mania. Drew's return was equally strong, and the opener with Sheamus set a high bar for this week's WWE programming. However, the sad truth is that this felt like a satisfying end to a program that never truly got going. I feel Sheamus and Drew deserved a promoted match at Fastlane. Only other question is what other NBA courses do we think Shane is enrolled in? I don't know. Um... Hang paragliding or <laughs> I don't know. I have no clue. Alex from Portland says, Congrats to Bobby Lashley for suffering through Lashley's sisters, an awful wedding storyline with Lana bending over and showing his ass every week while Leo Rush shouted his name. Bobby Lashley tonight overcame not just the Miz, but some truly horrendous booking to become WWE champion. I'm glad WWE isn't going the WrestleMania six route and having champion versus champion since Riddle feels incredibly inferior to Lashley. Here's hoping the U.S. title gets some rehab heading to Mania. Yeah, I don't think we're gonna get the um, the ultimate. Did you see Riddle showdown. as the lumberjack cheering on Bobby Lashley during the match? Yeah, I guess. Um, He's just sitting there on the barricade cheering him on. This guy who's like murdered him week after week. But I guess, uh, well, um, last one here is from Maddie. Miz was the star of the show. I wasn't sure how this was gonna go, but it kept me hooked throughout the whole show. It was the right call for Lashley to take the title off of him. Miz's title reign was pretty entertaining, short but sweet. I was pretty impressed with the Sheamus Drew match. Braun versus Shane, interesting matchup, but I'm just I'm just in for seeing the next big Shane bump. The double Randy was quite something. This is amazing. I had a great laugh. A lot of filler, which was not good as per usual. My expectations are always low for Raw, but this show surpassed it barely. Thanks everybody for your feedback. And thanks to yes. everybody who joined us live in the Zoom chat. Yes, thanks for all tuning in. Double Double, Ice Cap, Espresso members of the cafe. Uh, we'll do this all again on Wednesday night for Rewind to Dynamite that will be live 15 minutes afterwards to chat about Shaquille O'Neal and how that all goes down. Shaq, yes. Um, I'm excited for it. Let's see what they do. A quick reminder for everything that we went through today. Uh, a lot of stuff coming out in the cafe this month. It is March, a brand new month, the perfect time to jump on. We've got Rewind Aways coming up this Tuesday with uh, WrestleMania 6. Later on this month with Evolve, we've got our Creed reviews. We've got Rewind Vision live this Saturday night at 10 p.m. Eastern. We've got the start of the Falcon and Winter Soldier reviews. Rewind a SmackDown every single Friday and... 15% off our Marvel t-shirts at store.postwrestling.com available to all patrons. So check postwrestlingcafe.com for that or your emails for your coupon code. Yes. Put that down. And Saturday, April 3rd, post podcast day, mark it down for all cafe members. So thank you to everyone for joining us. We'll be back Tuesday chatting WrestleMania 6.